For the next several weeks, we'll be focusing specifically on the eastern woodlands of North America and tracing how the distinctive Native American cultures of that region developed. This follows on from the looser focus we had on North America prior to last week's exam. By the early Archaic period, Native American cultures in the eastern woodlands had begun to adopt what Joseph Caldwell called primary forest efficiency, a strategy that made efficient and sustainable use of the forest resources that dominated their landscape. Population growth slowed compared to previously, but it did continue to grow. So as the long Archaic period progressed, the eastern woodlands filled with more and more people, never getting anything like what we would call full but still restricting the mobility of Native American peoples. This packing effect drove many of the cultural changes that took place in the Middle and Late Archaic periods. As with the Early Archaic, we can see population growth primarily through the lens of increasing numbers of increasingly large archaeological sites. This is a very imprecise way of gauging population, but the only option we have. Your textbook mentions several very large, more or less permanent base camps that date to the Middle and Late Archaic. The Reed site along the Green River in Kentucky, Modoc Rock Shelter in Southern Illinois, Coster site in the Illinois River Valley, and when viewed from the perspective of its impact on the practice of archaeology in North America, this site is quite possibly the most important archaeological site ever dug. I don't have time to talk about it in depth, but if you're interested in how and why North American archaeologists do things the way that they do, read this book, Coster, Americans in Search of Their Prehistoric Past. It's what we've learned from sites like Coster and Modoc that allows us to look in more depth at the changes that transformed early archaic hunter-gatherers into the woodland tradition farmers that we'll study next week. The Middle Archaic is traditionally considered to run from 6,000 to 3,000 BC, even though, as Milner points out in the textbook, those dates don't really reflect calendar years very well. The same can be said for the Late Archaic, which is traditionally from 3,000 to 1,000 BC. Remember that numerical dates should not really be the focus of archaeology. Those numbers are really just tools to help us, rather than absolute statements of fact. What's more important is the culture process that gives structure uh, to cultures, not the numbers and dates themselves. Anyway, roughly 8,000 years ago or so, as this strategy of primary forest efficiency came into full effect throughout much of the eastern woodlands, a series of cultural changes happened that adapted people to the new lifestyle. The start of the Middle Archaic is marked technologically by an expansion of groundstone technology and by what Bruce Smith calls the Container Revolution. Groundstone technology relies on a fundamentally different process from making flaked stone tools, grinding and pecking, that is light and repeated hits from another stone. It allows the use of much harder stone like granite that's not suitable for flaking, and it produces much harder, more durable tools. But those tools can also be much heavier, and they take much longer to produce. The reduced mobility of Middle Archaic groups probably drove the adoption of groundstone technology. You move less, so you have less access to flakable stone. But you also have more time in camp to grind. The most commonly found Middle Archaic groundstone tools are grooved axes and atlatl banner stones, that is, weights for spear throwers. The Container Revolution also produced a fundamental shift in material culture. For the first time, durable, sturdy, and easily available containers for food were available. Remember that subsistence strategies were shifting towards collecting and storing large amounts of food in the Archaic, and containers are essential for those activities. Whereas Paleo-Indian and early Archaic peoples must have made do with skin bags and basketry, we don't think that they had woven textiles, that is cloth, at that, in those periods. Um, the Middle Archaic peoples first began using cucurbits as containers. Cucurbits are more colloquially known as squash and gourds. Bruce Smith, 
one of the most prominent eastern woodlands archaeologists of the last several decades, believes these plants were first used primarily as containers and only later eaten as food. We find remains of bottle gourd rinds in archaeological contexts in the eastern woodlands by about 5000 BC. Other, potentially more useful containers show up in various portions of the eastern woodlands during the late archaic. In the Appalachian uplands about 2000 BC, people began making ground stone steatite bowls. Along the Atlantic coast, the earliest pottery appeared about 2500 BC, but it was very low quality and did not expand much beyond the area until after 1000 BC, the beginning of the early woodland period. More on that next week. What these containers did for the archaic peoples was allow them to gather, transport, store, and process a wider variety of foods more efficiently. With stone bowls and pottery, it was finally possible to put watertight containers directly over fires, and thus boiling was finally practical. Gourds were literally bottles that grew every summer, so there was never a shortage of containers. This revolution in subsistence technology drove the population growth of the late archaic. And what foods were being processed in those containers? After about 4000 BC or so, they were increasingly farmed crops. The Eastern Agricultural Complex, a set of native North American domesticated crops, developed in the Middle Archaic and remained the core farmed crops for thousands of years. This transition from a strictly hunting and gathering subsistence strategy to one mixing wild and cultivated foods is a major watershed event in North American prehistory, and it warrants a closer look at the cultural process that would lead people to make the shift. But first, I want to dispel a prevalent myth. There was never a point in time when people did not know that planting seeds in the ground would result in new plants growing the next season. Making a living as a hunter-gatherer requires an intimate knowledge of the environment and the functions of living, of living things. Any hunter-gatherer who didn't know the relationship between seeds and the next generation of plants would soon starve. So it's not that hunter-gatherers are ignorant of planting and harvesting, they just choose not to do so. In fact, one might say they chose rightly. When the two groups live side by side and share similar levels of technology, hunter-gatherers work less, eat better, and are healthier than their farmer neighbors. An African bushman put it pretty well. When asked why his family didn't farm, he replied, Why should we plant when there are so many mangongo nuts in the world? So why would anyone ever become a farmer? It's all related to increased sedentism and decreased mobility. For a variety of reasons that I won't go into, being a nomadic hunter-gatherer strictly limits human populations even when there is plenty of food available in the natural environment. These biological constraints are lifted, however, when humans stop moving around so much, as was happening in the eastern woodlands during the Archaic. So once people become sedentary, population densities begin to rise, which we also see during the late Archaic. And this rise in population density sets in motion a sequence of events that ends in agriculture. As mobility decreased, uncertainty in food supplies increased. In the Paleo-Indian period, a poor harvest would be solved by simply moving somewhere else. But that wasn't always possible by the Middle Archaic. To manage the risk of a poor harvest, Archaic hunter-gatherers increased the energy and attention they devoted to collecting wild foods, choosing which stands of wild foods to collect and how much of them to leave. They cleared the forest canopy to promote new growth, and hunted the wildlife that would otherwise have eaten the plants indiscriminately. All of this tending changed the environment to which the plants were themselves adapting. The archaic peoples eventually produced genetic changes in a variety of species. A domesticated plant is one that has undergone genetic changes that make it dependent on human activity to reproduce. That is, they're no longer able to survive as wild plants, and they become crops. By 2000 BC, archaic peoples had domesticated several species, 
mostly common local plants gathered for their starchy or oily seeds. Aside from gourds, which may have been cultivated for thousands of years as containers, the five major crops were marsh elder, knotweed, maygrass, goosefoot, and sunflower mostly species that are considered weeds today. Eastern North America is thus one of maybe five or six parts of the world where agriculture developed indigenously. These domesticated foods never contributed the majority of archaic diets, nor were they ever cultivated in large open fields, so archaic peoples can hardly be called agricultural, or even farmers. Archaeologists generally consider the eastern agricultural complex to be horticultural, or gardening, with the crops used to supplement gathered food sources. The EAC crops began to dominate diets in the woodland period and remained an important part of Native American diets up to about AD 900, when Mexican crops, the most important of which is maize or corn, were introduced. Next, I'd like to turn from diet to mound building. During the late archaic period, a variety of different cultural traditions developed in the Midwest and Southeast, each devoting time and effort to constructing permanent monumental architecture. In parts of the eastern woodlands, these early mound sites coincide with the appearance of exotic, non-local materials in otherwise simple, egalitarian settings. Perhaps the appearance of monumental architecture is linked with the growing sense of local community that developed as long-distance trade increased. In northern Louisiana, about 3400 BC, the site of Watson Break is the earliest well-known mound center. It marks the beginning of a 5,000-year-long tradition of mound building in the eastern woodlands. Watson Break has 11 mounds, between 1 and 8 meters high, in a circular pattern around an open space 280 meters in diameter. It must have been constructed by still largely nomadic hunter-gatherers, since the large semi-permanent camps and EAC crops from the Midwest had not spread to Louisiana by this time. Again, why did they do it? Perhaps the mobile peoples in the region gathered regularly at Watson Break for community building ceremonies that strengthened their sense of belonging sort of like a summer fair. Not unsurprisingly for this summer fair analogy, the site has also displayed more than its share of exotic trade goods from far away. People probably came to the site for some important ceremony, but they also took the opportunity to make a buck in the process. Watson Break is a middle archaic site. A major late archaic mound site is Poverty Point, also in northeastern Louisiana. Poverty Point has even more evidence of a wide trade network, bringing in exotic materials from as far away as Lake Superior. The mounds at Watson Break, which were already 2,000 years old when Poverty Point was constructed, were large, but Poverty Point's monumentalism is even more impressive. Poverty Point construction began about 1600 BC, and it reached its final plan about 1000 BC. Poverty Point sits on the edge of Bayou Mason, it consists of six concentric circular embankments, split into sections by several avenues. In the middle of the concentric ridges lies a large, artificially leveled town plaza, and opposite the river is a massive pyramidal mound, 21 meters high by 200 meters long. Unlike Watson Break, Poverty Point was a residential site, the first planned town in North America, and almost certainly the largest settlement of its time. People lived here while exchanging all the exotic goods they had to trade. But for whatever reason, it did not leave any cultural descendants. Around the start of the early woodland period in the area, about 600 BC, Poverty Point was abandoned and whatever social complexity had developed there was discarded. Things in the area became smaller and more local again until about a thousand years later, during the middle woodland period, when the Marksville culture participated in the Hopewell interaction sphere, which we'll get to next week. Outside of Louisiana, 
mound building was also taking place in other parts of the eastern woodlands. The most well-studied late archaic mounds in the Midwest are found in the Illinois River Valley. These are very different from the, the Louisiana mounds, however. Illinois late archaic mounds are accretional burial mounds. Individuals from the community were buried on the slopes of pre-existing mounds and then covered over with a thin layer of soil so that over time the mounds grew bit by bit. These cemeteries were placed on prominent bluff top ridges overlooking the Illinois River Valley and could be seen from quite far away if one knew where to look. Douglas Charles and Jane Bykstra, both influential Illinois Valley archaeologists, believe mounds were essentially private property signs. As local communities became more and more restricted in their seasonal movements, and as the Illinois Valley became more and more packed with people, cemeteries provided potent claims to a particular territory's resources, proving that your ancestors had always been there and that you had an exclusive right to the wild foods in the area. It's easy to see how the Illinois burial mounds could be made by small communities of hunter-gatherers just taking their tentative first steps into farming, but Poverty Point's 21-meter-high mound has led many people to suppose that there must have been a very sophisticated political authority in control of a, of a very large population. As Milner points out, this is not the case. Construction on the mound took place over the course of centuries, and as few as a hundred people working for a week or two every year could have accomplished the same outcome. Right now, there is no evidence to suggest a fundamental change in social organization during the Middle and Late Archaic. Native American cultures were still egalitarian bands. That is not necessarily the case for the following woodland period, when tribal forms of organization began to appear, a further response to increasing population pressures. But, as before, that's a topic for next week. <laughs>